This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We help people to make space for what matters and get more done. And we partner with some of the world's leading companies who share our mission to transform the world of work. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Monica Aldama. Monica is the star of the hit Netflix show Cheer, which I'm sure you've heard people you know raving about. She's the multi-championship winning cheerleading coach for Navarro College in Corsicana, Texas. And she's now put some of her brilliant leadership mantras from the series into a really wise and interesting leadership book. So in this episode, I talk to Monica about what it's been like to suddenly find herself as the center of attention. We talk about her book, Full Out, as well as family, humility, and more. And there's loads in here that I think will help you to instill a winning mentality in whatever it is that you're doing. It's Coach Monica. This is Monica Aldama. I'm with Monica Aldama. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm really good. It's so good to have you on the show and you're in your your famous office in the (laughs) background. So people who've been watching this on YouTube and have seen uh, the Netflix show Cheer, you'll know exactly what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so let's start at the beginning. So my show is called Beyond Busy, and it's all about thinking about busyness, productivity, how people define success. There's so much in your show, Cheer, and also in the book as well that I want to talk about that really fits into those topics. But I guess let's start with the title. So the show is called Beyond Busy. Your last two or three years have been beyond busy, right? So just describe what does busyness mean to you over the last two or three years? Let's start there. Well, I think um, anybody that's a coach is already bu- just busy, period, because uh, we don't m- normally have a, a typical eight to five job. It is pretty much 24 seven because you never know when someone's gonna need you. Your schedules usually revolve around games and practices and uh, <clears throat> not your traditional daytime job. So just the fact that I have so many responsibilities coaching. I've already led a really busy life. I have to keep um, a very structured calendar so that I know what days I have available to do what. And then you yeah. add uh, filming a show on top of that, which, you know, when they first approached me, they were like, oh, we'll just be like a fly on the wall. You'll never know. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, great. That's, that that sounds perfect. But that you, they, they actually film... 12 hours a day that their schedule is 12 hours a day and they they want to stay busy filming something so if they don't have anything to film they're following me around they're in my office they're at my house what are you doing can we go with you to get your hair done whatever you know so (laughs) um so on top of coaching uh the past few years i've had to also then allow cameras to follow me everywhere which also at times then takes my normal schedule and and makes it even longer just because things that I need to get done, I then do later. So um, yeah, busy is just, you know, and then then I'm a wife and a mother, so it's tough trying to fit it all in, but but we do. (laughs) It's busy, busy, busy. Um, So let's just back up for people who haven't seen the show, um, which I loved. And there's a bit at at the start of the book where you talk about You'd watched Last Chance You, which I watched a few years ago and absolutely loved as well. And basically, then you get like an email saying, hey, you know, Last Chance You, the people who made that, they want to make a show about your cheerleading team, like in your hometown. What was that like when you, that moment when you got that email and um, like, how did you respond to that? Well, you know, it was very, it was very strange the way it happened because I had, literally just seen last chance you a couple of weeks before and i was right. intrigued because it was a it was about junior college football number one i wor- have worked at a junior college for forever and i love football so obviously i love junior college football too i'm very invested in that so um you know my my, my future son-in-law was watching it at my house and i walked in and 
I got pulled in and I was like, what is this about? I started watching. I know these teams, you know, I know about junior college football. And, but it, it was also very funny because there was a lot of cussing in it. So I, the first <laughs> thing I thought was, oh, there's absolutely no way our school would ever let us film, you know, do something <laughs> like this. And, um, and then a couple of weeks later, I got this email and it was just so surreal. You know, I, I couldn't even fathom the thought that I, here I am just literally talking about the people that produce this show or this show. And, and now here I'm getting contacted about interest in doing cheerleading. And I thought it would go nowhere. I, I did go yeah. and talk to my athletic director for a quick minute just to let him know. But then he was he was like, oh, yeah, you need to call him back. And so I was like, okay, well, hey, hey don't, maybe this is going to go somewhere. I don't know. And did you get a sense, I mean, especially the first series of, of Last Chance You, the, the coach in that is such a central character, isn't he? Did you get a sense very early on that this was going to really be big for you personally, like you were going to be one of the main uh, sort of features of the show and the star of the show? No, not at all. I, uh, I didn't even think in, that, in those terms at all. I, uh, you know, just first of all, I had to get over the fact that maybe we were, we were actually considering this. And I am a very private person. I don't like to be in the spotlight. Mm. I don't like a lot of attention. And so... Um, after thinking that through for a moment, really what I was most excited about was the opportunity to just show people how uh, athletic my team was, how the work ethic that they have, how driven they are, the commitment that it takes to even compete at the level that we do. Because I, a lot of people just really don't get it. They don't understand. Yeah. You know, I can talk about, oh, we do this and that. But at the end of the day, the word cheerleading has a very big stereotype. So I didn't think that, I I thought, I hoped that maybe cheerleaders would watch it. So there was no thought of like last chance you, it's going to be big, it's going to be, I, you know, I literally just thought of it as an opportunity to um, show people what we do, but really I thought it would be in the cheer community and that was it. And I never thought about myself. yeah, I just I never never thought beyond a great opportunity to show off the skills that my team has, you know. Yeah, and I was definitely in that category that you describe of people who have I'd never really. I mean, I'm in the UK, right? Like we we just don't really have cheerleading here in the same way. Um, didn't really know much about it, and I mean, what hooked me first was just watching the trailer on Netflix and just <laughs> and kind of being like, whoa, this is really different to what I thought, but. It's it's quite some of it's quite I mean it's so physical like some of it's quite brutal isn't it in a way where especially that there's one of those I think it's the end of the first episode where they're sort of falling on the mat and there's all these really like high intensity tumbles and physical moves going on so like have you kind of really noticed that there's been um, just a change in perception like because of the show just around the USA like is that has that kind of really changed for you since the show? Definitely, because, I mean, people in the cheer community, they know. Um, <clears throat> but so many people reached out to me after the show that are in the cheer community and said, thank you for showing the world what we actually do, because no one ever understood. No, nobody ever understood what, why I would sacrifice, you know, my personal time and, and, and stuff to, to put all my passion and efforts into this sport. And now they get it. Now they understand. It, it's truly, you know, something athletic and um, that these kids are incredibly talented. And, um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, it, I think the, it, we don't fall all the time. And it, <laughs> it is definitely safe as long as you are educated and uh, you have, you know, coaches that are educated to know how to uh, do progressions up to the more difficult things. I think for TV, it was... Um, you know, they did show every single fall that we had because that probably makes right. good TV. Yeah. But yeah. it is physical and it is and it can be dangerous. But um, like I said, we're educated, we're experienced and we know how to uh, do things. I mean, do things safely. Obviously, just like any other sport, you're going to have your typical injuries from overuse of, uh, you know, some, some of these kids have been doing gymnastics since they were three years old so their ACLs are a little bit worn out or you know that's just typical with any kind of sport that you have though yeah um I suppose yeah so what I might do is just I'll um 
flip between some bits from the book and then some bits from the show. So should we start with the title of the book? So Full Out, there's a kind of double meaning there. Do you want to just explain the double meaning of, of Full Out? Yeah, so in, full, uh, in cheerleading terms, when we, talk, when we say let's go full out, um, we're talking about doing our competitive routine with every single skill thrown. Um, and full outs are really hard because it's exhausting to do. It, it may not seem like very much time. For us, it's two minutes and 15 seconds, but yeah. it's like running as fast as you can for two minutes and 15 seconds. It's exhausting. And to do all the athletic things that they do in that short amount of time, um, and we do very fast-paced routines, so there's not a moment to breathe or to to rest. You know, you're constantly going. It's very difficult to do. Um, and so, you know, the t- I thought it was such an appropriate title because you definitely should want to live your life full out too and put that effort and that energy into all areas of your life so that you're, yeah. you know, fulfilling everything at the maximum. And your, I mean, your sort of approach to life is full out too, right? So there's a few times in the book and in the show where you talk about you get home really late, you're up really early, like, you know, your your pace of life is, is really relentless, right? Yes. I mean, um, once again, it, it's a choice to uh, make those sacrifices because I do want to be the best at uh, not only my job, but, you know, whether that means I'm running from my job to go watch my child at, at a, you know, school program and then back to another practice or whatever. It's just, uh, you know, I want to be involved in my family. I want to give 100% at my job. So, you know, you, you have to yeah. make those sacrifices. And let's talk about family because that feels like it's a huge... It's just a, a theme of the book and a theme of the show and the amount of times in the show where you talk about your kids and there's there's it feels like there's this dynamic where you are you're such a, a mom and actually sometimes a mom to kids that haven't really had um you know strong parental figures in their lives um like what does family mean to you what's your kind of philosophy around family well my my family is is super close we are um pretty much each other's best friends. My kids are grown now. My uh, son is 25. My daughter is about to get married. She's in law school. So they're both adults. They're grown. Um, But we enjoy each other's time so much. When they're home uh, for the weekends, you know, if we're at home doing a game night, that's the most fulfilling thing, you know, just being able to spend time together Um, going out behind our house to go fishing, whatever it is, we really, really enjoy each other's time. And so my family is my best sister friend, friends. And my second family, which is my cheer family, is the same. I might spend more time with them, you know, at certain times of the year than I do with my own family because of the jobs and responsibilities that we have. And so we're super close. Um, I am like a mother figure to them, you know, but I'm also more than that because as a coach, you have to wear a lot of different hats. So, you know, I'm their advisor, I'm their counselor, I'm their disciplinarian, I'm, you know, the mother figure when they need it, I'm, you know, the coach. So whatever, and and there's a lot of them. So I'm constantly feeling, you know, I'm constantly uh, fulfilling that role for someone. Uh, Someone needs to come in and talk, someone, whatever. Um, And it's a huge responsibility. So but we are super close. We spend so much time together. We all are working hard towards the same goals. And, you know, it's just like with, with any family, you know, we're together so much that there's, there's ups and downs. You're going to be uh, upset with someone one day and then have the best memory ever the next. But at the end of the day, you're going to have each other's back. You know, we can all um, argue or, or bicker but as soon as someone outside of the family comes in and we're like no 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 get back this is our little unit you know yeah um there was a, a bit that really surprised me and struck me at the start of the second series so you've got this first series goes out it does really well um it kind of made celebrities and and social media stars of so many of the cast so many of your students 
And then so in the second series, it starts and they've all got cameo accounts and Instagram followings and all this kind of stuff. And it felt like some of them, I don't know if this was just the editing, but it felt like some of them were very preoccupied with that as you would be and very distracted by that. And I was thinking, surely your job is to keep them really focused on like the business of cheer. But actually what you did with a couple of people, you were like, I can't be your agent here, but you need to get an agent and let's really explore this. And you were really supportive of them going on big TV shows and and, and sort of becoming stars too. And it really kind of, there's like a, a bit of a, a sort of penny drop moment. And I'd love to just uh, like, just kind of see what, what you think of this. But it felt to me like the, the actual business of, of competing and cheerleading, like you see that you want to win, but also you see that as, the route to to the success of those kids' lives. And then suddenly you just had like a shortcut or another route that people could take here where actually they can, you know, they can make money, they can be, they can have careers off the back of the show, as well as the discipline that they learn through cheerleading, like setting them up for life in more regular careers. Is that kind of how you were seeing it at, at that time? Well, I mean, here's the thing. I have always been so supportive of any opportunity that um, any of them have had, whether it was in the cheerleading industry or or not. So, for example, before pre pre show, um, you yeah. know, a lot of the there I would have several students that did uh, modeling for some of the cheer uniform companies, and so there's you know been times where they needed to leave for a week. You know, when we were say early on in the season, it wasn't you know in our competition season, it was. Um, early on when school started, <clears throat> they would need to leave for or be gone for a week because they were going to go overseas to do a photo shoot. And I've always been supportive of any opportunity because um, you never know which one is going to give you a career. Um, and at the very least, I would never want them to miss out on an experience, you know. So yeah, I've had yeah. some that have gone off to uh, wherever, you know, to another country though and do these amazing trips where they've been able to do photo shoots and so not only get paid to do something but also have that experience of traveling internationally where some of them do not have the money to do that without this opportunity so I've always yeah. been very supportive of anything even outside of cheerleading that that uh, as long as it didn't interfere with our competition schedule or something like that I've always been very flexible and worked around anything so that didn't change. But when the show came out, obviously this opened up an entirely new, huge level of opportunities. And uh, once again, I'm there to be their biggest cheerleaders too. And I want them, you know, if they're going to have an opportunity to be an actress, I'm going to support them 100%. Or to go and be an influencer on social media, I'm going to support them 100%. Because like I said, a lot of these kids, this might be their one shot to to have this career that's going to financially support them for the rest of their life. You never know. Uh, and something like this, none of us, none of us knew this show was going to be big. Like I said, we thought, we hoped maybe cheerleaders would watch it. And that was it. So we were caught completely off guard. I think Netflix was caught off guard too. I don't think that they mm -hmm. thought that, I don't think I think they thought this would be like a baby sister to Last Chance You, when it actually yeah. Yeah. overtook Last Chance You. You know, <laughs> so so no, none of us were prepared for this at all, and then it just kind of exploded. But I was certainly going to um, be their biggest supporters if they needed help, and I, I I know nothing about any of that industry, but I was willing to reach out, to read emails, to do whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, we were in Daytona season at that time and, yeah, right. and none of us lost focus. I know that was kind of the media kind of put a big, you know, a lot, lot of the interview questions I was getting at the time was, oh, y'all, you know, are y'all distracted? Y'all have all this attention. And because of that, I think we worked twice as hard, <laughs> but we were yeah. not going to let anything, we had the eyes of the world on us. We were not going to disappoint anyone, you know? So when we went into cheer practice, all of that was left outside. Um, and we practiced so hard 
that when the pandemic happened, that was like right at the end of our spring break. We were so prepared. We probably could have, even though we still had a few weeks left to get ready, we probably could have competed right then. That's how well prepared we were and how not distracted we were. It seemed, I think the way it was edited, like there were distractions. And obviously, let me tell you, I was working, I, I was barely getting any sleep because I was trying to do the press that they were wanting me to do on top of yeah. Daytona season, on top of coming in, you know, after practices and strategizing routine. And, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a fighter and I'm a worker. So it, you know, it didn't matter if I was getting two hours of sleep. I was, I was not going to let anyone think that we were distracted. We were going to work twice as hard to be ready. Yeah. And you mentioned Daytona there. We should probably just, for those people who haven't seen the show, mm -hmm. just explain what that is. And I've got a bit of a question around that. So what makes it such good, it makes it such a good subject matter for a big documentary series is that the entire focus of your year comes down to this kind of, you know, two minutes, what is it, two minutes and 15 seconds or something? Yeah. Um, when you hit this one performance in Daytona, um, you know, next to the beach in front of everybody and, and that who, that's who decides who the champions are for that year. And one of the things that I guess comes from that, which anybody listening to this, you know, whether you're in business, you know, whatever you're working towards in your life, you're going to have those moments in your life which are about pressure. And this feels like it's just the most super pressured environment. So I'd love you to just share any thoughts about how you keep people sane and on the straight and narrow and focused in the midst of like massive pressure. And then the other question I want to know about is um, when someone then is the the reason why you don't win, like some, somebody's slight stumble is the, it, you know, is an accidental thing that happens and, it, and is the reason that doesn't win. How do you deal with the fallout of that sort of pressure where, you know, that person is really feeling guilty and feeling like they've let everybody down and that, that seems like such a tough situation as well. So yeah, talk to us about Daytona and pressure and both sides of that. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a lot. That's a lot. Let me get, let me, let me get through that. Um, <laughs> so as far as the pressure, I mean, it, it's, it's terrifying to compete in Daytona. And I think anyone that's ever experienced it, it's, um, it's on a whole nother level because number one, it is your one shot. <laughs> you don't, you don't have any other opportunities. You get, you work an entire year for this one moment. So that in itself is a ton yeah. of pressure. You don't get a redo. You don't get, well, there's another competition, you know, in a couple of weeks. No, you get one shot. Uh, number two, it's outside on a stage and all the different elements of sun and wind. And it's just, it's a lot of pressure. It's, a, you know, so what we do here, this has been my strategy forever. And I think it's one of the reasons that we are so successful is we really try to imitate everything that's going to happen in Daytona here at home so that some of those unknown things they, they they don't feel so unknown when we get there so the way we warm up is very we you know imitate the exact structure of our warm-up we imitate the walk from the warm-up room to where we're actually going to compete and we walk to what we call our clock tower and back and that's just you know putting ourselves through that moment of having to get somewhere else and then um you know in the in season two you see where I've been talking about for years wanting to get this stage and we actually did that last year it was kind of that final piece of if we could just put them in this situation where they can feel it before they actually get there it's going to yeah. take off a little yeah. bit of that pressure you know and so we've done a really good job of preparing ourselves not only physically but mentally for when we get there and when we get there we're like it's just another day at practice it's not a big deal it's just another day at practice mm -hmm. so um, I do think that that's one of the reasons that we have been so successful. Um, number two, when someone does make a mistake, that is a heavy weight to carry, to carry for the rest of your life. You're always going to be yeah. known as that one person that messed up, you know, and that happens sometimes. And, you know, um, I just, we, we win as a team, we lose as a team. And that's kind of what we always say. I know in the moment, 
the emotions can run high and people can, you know, say things that are um, coming from just an emotional part. But I think that we're pretty good at the end of the day, you know, like letting that go and knowing that, you know, some, you know, things just happen. And last year was a great example. We had one minor, it wasn't minor mistake. But it just felt so unfair because it was just such a, it felt like such a small thing. Such a small thing, but we got penalized big time for this one small mistake. And, you know, um, the people involved in that one stunt, they felt a tremendous amount of guilt. You know, Jill, all she could do was keep apologizing to me as soon as we walked off. And I'm like, it's, it's okay. You know, I tried to to be the mother figure in that moment and comfort her like I would want someone to comfort my own child. Um, Mm. So, um, you know, this year we, it's amazing. We all just love each other and uh, none of that has carried over like, oh, this person made a mistake. We kind of laugh about it now. It's, you know, it, it happened, it's over. We're moving forward. We have new goals and everybody's working, you know, their butts off to, to reach this goal. So it's it's not always great when you're the person that makes a mistake. And, you know, it I, I would assume would be a, a heavy weight to carry forever. But um, but we've we've done a really good job, you know, as, of like lifting each other up and, you know, moving forward. Mm. And are there any sort of favorite pep talks that you give? Obviously, when people arrive at Daytona, yes, you've done all the rehearsals and you've got people to the place where they know what to expect, sort of like physically and mentally. But then I'm sure like, you know, anyone who's had to stand up in front of an audience or do something that is, you know, in a high profile situation or with a lot of eyes on you, just that is it is different, isn't it? There is, there is no substitute for just that experience. And you've been through it, you know many times and for many of these kids it's their first time is there anything that you say to them that really helps them to to connect back into that sense of it's the same as any other practice well you know like I said one of the things that we've really been leaning on lately the past couple years is it's just another day at practice because we we want to prepare them so well um you know just to get them to relax and the key is confidence you know if you're confident in yourself it kind of takes away a little bit of the nerves when when you don't feel confident about something it's a whole added layer of nervousness that you're putting on there so which is why we practice so much we want to build that confidence in them so you know we definitely say another day at practice a lot to to kind of lessen that pressure um and just to have fun because we've trained so hard that our bodies know what to do now we need to enjoy that and have fun with it. Yeah, yeah. love that. Um, going to pick out a couple of bits from the book. So, um, I mean, my my book, my main book is about productivity uh, and I'm a real planner. And I love your thing about the $5 planner and this sort of motto and, and almost like uh, metaphor that you give to your students around the $5 planner. So um, tell us the importance of the $5 planner. Well, like I was saying earlier, um, my life is so busy that it has to have some structure. And I'm very old school. I like I I know that technology has surpassed the old school planner, but I still like to write it down and I like to turn the page and I like to see it. I like to see the whole month, you know. Um, so I, I love a planner, even with the technology, even with your mm. your Google Calendar that I'm going to go look and see what all I've got this week, you know, (laughs) but, um, but it, if you put your responsibilities, uh, down, you know, like I said, you, it, it gives you a screenshot of how to manage your time, number one. And a lot of these kids not only go to school here and compete here, they do all-star cheerleading, which is like club, you know, cheerleading. And it requires a lot of their time outside of it. So, there's no way you can make your grades, be at everything on time, and if you don't have that screenshot so you can see, and this is something I really try to, you know, drill into them at the beginning. Like, you have to look at your week and see if you have a paper due, well, you've got all these responsibilities, mm. when are you gonna be able to write that paper? And if you don't plan it, you don't write it down, 
and you think about it right before it's due, it's not going to happen. You know, you don't, and don't, you know, so we have to plan. We have to like write it down, see it, see your week or your month and know when you're going to be able to fulfill these other responsibilities with your schoolwork and um, your assignments. And how about maybe rest your body? Like, when are you going to do all these things, you know? So Mm, it's so important to have some structure and be able to see it and write it down and and plan it and get your time management together. And I guess that must be difficult for people who have they've always lived at home and suddenly they're not only moving away from home, but they're doing you know they're on the cheer program they've also got to hit their grades as well and like you said they've they've got these other responsibilities outside of that um do you do you get people who find that just really difficult to uh, to kind of take ownership for their responsibilities and (laughs) are there are there things that you can do that what 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 have you found that's really worked to really help people to take ownership of, of what they need to do you know it yes i mean first of all we're talking about all kinds of personalities all kinds of backgrounds coming together so it's a difficult job for me and there's some that i never have to say a word to they are so on top of it they have a 4.0 at the end of the semester they are easy they're my easy ones you know but we do grade grade checks every few weeks and so i can kind of see quickly who are the ones i need to get a hold to they're struggling you know, and honestly, the best thing that I've, I've been able to do to, to teach some of these that need more help is the, com- the personal conversations that we have and trying to speak to them in a way that's, number one, respectful so that they don't feel like I'm demeaning them or, or getting yeah. on to them. It's more of a conversation where we can talk it through and I can kind of switch it up so they can see because a lot of them, when they, you know, the self accountability is what we're tra- what we're talking about here. You know, are you taking responsibility for the fact that you just dropped the ball and didn't get the assignment done? Because a lot of times they'll give you that excuse. Well, I, I tried, to, I couldn't get it uploaded. You know, this is a perfect example of a student I just talked to a couple weeks ago. <laughs> they didn't have their. I had gotten an email from their teacher, you know, we were doing grade checks. I got an email from their teacher that said, you know, they need to work on this, this, and this. But also I gave them two extra days to get this assignment in because they were having trouble uploading it and they still didn't get it in. So I'm like, mm. so, you know, I pulled the student to the side and, I'm, and I said, you had two extra days beyond what the due date was. What, what was the problem? Well, I couldn't get it to up. I was having problems getting it to upload and I was trying to get help from, and I was like, two days, two, you know, like (laughs) I said, it's a very minimum. You should have printed that paper off, walked it over to your teacher's office and given it to her so that number one, she knew you did it. Number two, that's when you ask for help. I want you to know I did the, I did the assignment. This is it. I am having trouble getting it uploaded. Can you help me send me in the right direction? But I want you to know that number one, I care. Number two, I did it. You know, it's all about, you know, your approach. Because when you tell me you are having problems getting it uploaded, if I'm the teacher, I'm going to think, well, they didn't do it. They're, you know what I mean? And so, and I said, and what did you do in those 48 hours? Like, what kind of help were you trying to get that you still couldn't, you know? But, but she was trying to give me some excuses. Well, I, and I'm like, no, 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 like 48 hours you had extra, you know? And so mm. she, finally she's like, you're, yes, you're right. I, you know, but, and I have another, oh my goodness, another student that I've been working on <laughs> for two years now. That's the, the, the epitome of giving an excuse. And he has done so well. I'm so proud of him. He's, he still has a little bit of work to do, but he has taken some ownership of whenever he's late or just, you know, some things. And, and it's honestly all about the conversations. And it's not a, it's not, it's not me getting on to them. It's just a conversation of us talking and me trying to flip the situation so they can see it. And then, and they really don't have a choice, but to go, you're right, you know, and, and, and be able to say, you're right. I, I just didn't do it or whatever. Just, just being able to say it sometimes because saying that you screwed up, that's actually a great thing. That's you taking ownership, you know, and I think I'm going to respect, and I tell them this too, you know, I'm going to respect you so much more 
if you have just apologize and own it, than trying to give me an excuse. And if we can all just kind of start shifting in that direction of let's take the ownership and let's just try to make it right, you know, and learn from it and do better next time. Yeah, I used to work for a boss who used to have a phrase which was, I have no problem if you screw up as long as you own up and clear up. And, I love uh, that. I just that think is perfect. Something... So important about um, taking that ownership. Um, what struck me there as you're telling that story is like you, like like you're you're playing this role where you're really giving people life lessons, aren't you? And and some of the stuff that I'm sure you've got alumni who are you know sort of 10, 15 years down the track coming back and saying, "Hey, remember that thing you taught me? Like I'm using that now in you know some completely tangential, different place." And what's also, and, and, and that's really clear when you watch the show and people, people talk about you so fondly on the show, but the, the route to get there is like, it's like through the dirt, isn't it? Like you've really got to put the hours in to, you know, and probably like tell people things that are going to, that they're going to go in one ear and out the other so many times before they get to the place where they're at, those lessons are actually going to land and you start to see that change. So what motivates you on the days where you, you don't have people saying, hey, Monica, you've changed my life, but you, you just feels like you're kind of talking, a, talking to a brick wall or something like what keeps you motivated in, in those kind of moments? Well, you know, I uh, I've said many times here lately that and I think I even said it in the show, you know, like I've been here a long time. I, this is now my 28th year. So I've, right. I've proved things that I want. I set out to prove as a young person coming in that I was a good coach that I know what I'm doing, that I can win a national championship or two, you know. And so I feel like I'm still here because I do have a purpose that's beyond winning national championships. And so investing in these athletes to try to help, you know, mold them into uh, adults that are going to be successful in life, I do feel like that's my purpose. And so it's not always fun. And I, it, it's not that I'm motive, I, you know, that I'm on the hard days, I'm not motivated. It's just that I know that there will be an end result that's worth it. Kind of like working for those national championships, you know, it's not always fun. You're tired. I mean, we practice twice a day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So last night I got home at 1030, you know, yeah. for the day back at it this morning. So it is hard. It's not always fun, but I know that there's a, there's a goal that we're trying to meet. And so investing in these, you know, young athletes, there is a, a goal. I might not see it for five or 10 years. And like you said, it's that phone call. And I do get those. And, you know, sometimes they just want to call and tell me about a promotion they got because they know that I'm going to be so proud of them for putting in that work to get noticed, to get that promotion, because, you know, that's what I'm trying, you know, trying to um, kind of, get into them as a young person like the payoff will come but you need to yeah. be on time and you know be respectful and do these all these things to you know show that you are worth that promotion or you know whatever so it's not immediate gratification by any means so I just I know that there's a a, a goal at the end and it's not something that I might even ever see but that you know because sometimes they'll they'll call me and say one time you told me blah, 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 blah. And I don't even remember the conversation because I have so many of them. But that stuck with them for, you know, 10 years later. They call me to talk about this one thing that I said to them. And and it, that's that's my purpose. That's what makes it worth it, you know? Yeah, I love that. Um, there's a couple of chapters of the book which really resonated, which I'd love to just talk a bit more about. So um, there's a chapter in the book that's called Leadership Starts With You. Um, so what do you mean by leadership starts with you? Well, I think that if you want to lead anybody, and this isn't just a coach leading a team, this is a parent leading their family, you know, um, a manager leading their team at work or whatever. But to me, the biggest thing is you, you have to lead by example because uh, respect is not demanded. You know, me yelling at you, is not going to earn your respect. I mean, but if you respect me because I am leading by example, 
um, then I've earned that. And I'm going to be able to guide you because you're going to want to make me proud. You know, you're going to want to call me in 10 years because you know I'm going to be so proud of you. Um, and I've really prided myself over the years of living my personal life the way I would expect them. To, you know, I have a lot of expectations of the of these young young kids. And, um, and I try really hard to live my personal life, of, you know, what I would want them to do. And because of that, I can come in and uh, be myself, you know, freely be myself and just earn their respect because they see that I am showing up early. I'm working really hard. I'm, uh, you know, making my family a priority. I'm making good decisions in my personal life. I'm, you know, not out acting crazy. I'm not, you know, doing anything like that. And um, I think, you know, whether you're trying to lead your family, you know, your kids are looking at you as the parent. Like, you can't expect your kids to act one way when you're out acting the complete opposite. You're not going to earn that respect. You're not going to be able to lead them. It can cause a lot of problems. And so, you know, that's another thing. I've really tried to be the person that I want my kids to be, you know. So when I'm trying to teach them these life lessons and stuff, they can look at their mother and their father and go, you know, they, these you know, not that any of us are perfect by any means, but, you know, that, that I have, you know, made, I am a, you know, good person and I work really hard and I, you know, um, things that I want to instill in them, I'm making sure to do myself. And I think that that's the yeah. most important thing about being a leader is you have to look at yourself, be able to take, be accountable and, and own up to the mistakes. Because even as the leader, if I own a mistake to my team, you know, that, that earns a lot of respect instead yeah. of me acting like I'm, you know, the perfect person because no, none of us are, you know. It's so true. I think um, the idea of saying I screwed up, I made a mistake or I got that wrong, like it's, um, it, you know, in a, lot, in a lot of settings that I see, it's it's almost like seen as a taboo. But I think it shows honesty. It shows self-reflection. Like there's so many good conclusions that you can come to about a person when you when you hear that stuff right absolutely absolutely mm. um i the best chapter name ever um i'd love you to tell the story so support your community and if you can't find another community um and that story about um your church community and the attitudes around um you like you have a number of students on your team who are gay and that came into conflict. Um, just such a powerful story. And it really showed um, a real, you know, thoughtfulness and humanity in the way that you told that story. Do you want to just just tell us that story? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, I am a big person on my faith. And uh, we had been going to this church for quite some time, for many years. And I love the pastor there. However, every once in a while, there were just sermons that <laughs> just made me a little uncomfortable. And, and one in particular was about uh, gay marriage. And it was so, um, against what I think that at that moment, my husband and I were we had a conversation and said, you know, we, we, we should probably start just looking at other churches. We, as much as we love this pastor and this church and our church family, like we have to be able to feel comfortable that we're aligned with the same thoughts and views. And, and not only that, a lot of these, you know, athletes, they're away from home. So sometimes they're like, you know, I would love to go to church. And if I can't invite them to my church, there's a problem, you know, and I was feeling very uneasy, like, well, what church should I tell them to go to? And, and it just felt very conflicting. And so we made the decision, we're going to start looking at other places. And we did, and we, we made that move. And, and I feel very comfortable where we're at. We do have, um, we have a great college youth group, not youth, but college group, you know, and I feel very comfortable inviting anybody that wants to come, you know, to come to the service, to get a, to be involved in the college group if they want. And I think that it is very important to have your 
values and your views aligned when you're talking about your faith. It's su- you know it's such a big part of my life, and um, I lean into my faith a lot when I'm going through difficult times, and uh, I just needed that to all feel like it was aligned together because, I, I mean, I've been coaching for 28 years. These kids, many of them gay, are my family, and yeah. I would go to bat. I mean, I would go down for these kids, you know. Mm. Yeah, and there's something really beautiful about that in terms of, you know, wanting the the wider community that you're part of to reflect you and wanting you to reflect that community. And also then that that is, um, you know, it like it, it is compatible with all the other parts of your life, right? So just feels like that's a really... Um, big and difficult decision to take and it sounds from the way you tell it in the book as well about how like the conversations you're having with the pastor about it and stuff like you're having it really openly and respectfully and compassionately and um oh, yeah, yeah just felt yeah. like a really well we definitely yeah he called me because mm. I, you know I've, and I don't do this anymore but I, t- I posted something on Facebook because I was so angry and I was so passionate <laughs> about it and we've all done that at some point <laughs> and so he called me and, you know, I, one thing I am is always very direct and honest, but very respectful, of, you know, and um, I mean, it was a, I cried, he cried. I mean, it was a powerful conversation, but I was not going to back down on my views or, you know, I mean, at the end of the conversation, we just agreed to disagree. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not going, you know, so that's how it was. And we moved on, went to a different church. That's also maybe something that we've lost sight of in recent years is the ability to agree to disagree. Like Mm -hmm. we don't all have to agree with all the same things all the time, right? Absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of minutes before I must let you go and get to your meeting because you are (laughs) very much in demand and and beyond busy. Um, So um, like you say at the start of the book that you, you, by taking part in the in this show and having your life filmed and everyone else's lives filmed what was really interesting was uh you understood more deeply the backgrounds of the kids that you're coaching so that really surprised me because i like i thought that they're sharing so much when they're like in practice with you that i thought um you must probably know all that but it seems like there was a lot that you um didn't know about some of the the difficult backgrounds that some of your students had so I just wondered, like, if there were any other reflections or just how that changed you as a coach or just anything else that having now um, been working in a way that is being filmed and you're a part of this show, like, how has it changed, actually, your style of leadership, your style of being a coach? You know, like I said in the book, I know the stories, but just seeing those interviews and some of the details that are spoken about, it, it just it hits it even harder. You know, yeah. and I think if anything, I think one thing this job has taught me over the years is to become more empathetic. And I think the show just even pushed that even further. You know, I mean, you know, there's different seasons of your life that you're learning and growing from. You know, I started this job when I was 22 years old. I knew nothing. I had a wow. lot to yeah. learn. And, and that's what I've been doing, learning and growing for now, you know, I'm on year 28. And so as much as I've taught these kids, they've taught me just as much, you know. And I think that, you know, once I became a mother myself, you know, that changed my thinking. I'm looking at, you know, from a parent's point of view now. And then, you know, when this show comes out and you see, it just takes that empathy and grows it deeper. And, you know, I think, I've always been, you know, every season of my life has been a learning, you know, I talk about my divorce in the book and that was such a growing moment for me of like, really, I think that's when I really changed my point of view of of taking that accountability. Not that I didn't before, but everything I do now, the first thing I think about is like, wait, what did I bring to the table? And I try to look at everything from that point of view. Uh, did I say that wrong? Should I have done this better? You know, and I take a lot of ownership in my own actions and, and everything. So 
I think, um, you know, if anything, the show just, you, you know, deepened that empathy that I already had. And I, you know, it, that drives the way I speak to people, the, the conversations that I have, you know, taking a moment to think what could have led to this, this person acting this way and just trying to go deeper, you know, into those relationships. And then I guess the final question. So the show has changed your life in in many ways. You've written this incredible book, which I hope everyone will go and uh, go and get and read. And you know, whether you're a, someone who's watched the show or not, like there's there's just so much um, you know wisdom and insight in that book. And that chapter actually about um, your divorce and then getting remarried to Chris as well, like it just absolutely in- incredible stories. But I guess my final question is: Is there anything that you so you've been on Dancing with the Stars, you've been on the Ellen Show, all this kind of stuff. Is there anything that you have particularly, um, there's been a, like a particular kind of life highlight as a result of, of taking part in the show? I mean, obviously, I've had so many opportunities that I would have not, you know, gotten previously. But I mean, I can name many. I mean, obviously, Dancing with the Stars, I have been a fan of that show since the very yeah. first season that it came out. So that was kind of a dream come true to experience that and now I'm you know part of that Dancing with the Stars family we just went actually I just took my team Sunday um, to their live tour that came through Dallas and my kids were blown away their mouths were open they they said I mean it was, we had so much fun it was a great little bonding experience there was a you know the whole team was there um, so that that was incredible I tell you uh, meeting Oprah Winfrey I mean, <laughs> someone that I had grew wow. up watching, yeah. she was electrifying. It That yeah. was like a moment I will never forget. Of course, Ellen, you know, I mm. that was great too. I mean, just, you know, I, I can't even believe it. I have to pinch myself sometimes that I've mm. been able to have these experiences. Um, Monica, it's been amazing having you on the show. And I've got to let you go because you're going to be late for your meeting if I don't <laughs> let you go. Yes, I um, do. So, just thank you so much for being on the show. Um, we will share everything on, on the show notes as well so that people can connect with you and find out more. But thank you so much for being on Beyond Busy. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organizations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programs, and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You want to sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you want to buy some of my books? Or do you just want to find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.